So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending of where you are joining us today. Uh, we have the pleasure of having Professor Lance Price from George Washington University today as a speaker in the Knowledge Dissemination Dialogue of uh, this month at the FAO. This is a webinar organized by the FAO AMR Working Group and the FAO Sustainable Livestock Technical Network, always happening on the third Thursday of the, the month around lunchtime here in Central Europe. A uh, topic that Professor Lance will speak about is using source associated mobile genetic elements to identify zoonotic extra intestinal E. coli infections. And I'm sure by the end of the presentation, this will be more digestible than the title sounds like. Just a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, rules. Please keep your microphone on mute. Please rename yourself uh, with your organization and country followed by your name. Please note that Professor Lance's uh, uh, views uh, are his own and not FAO's one. Please refrain from advertising your services, or your company, or any other commercial product or brand. And uh, please post your questions in the chat, the box that you have in the Zoom. And we'll the, the goal of this, it's called dialogue precisely because of that. We would like to have a lot of dialogue at the end and explore possibilities of collaborations between the speaker and the participants in the um, in this uh, webinar. Uh, the meeting is being recorded, and so please keep that in mind. And uh, after the, the it, we'll share the presentation and a couple of uh, additional resources that Professor Lance shared with us. And at the end, I will we'll post um, a link for a feedback survey. So I'll stop here, Lance, and the floor is yours. Enjoy the webinar. Thank you for opening that up, George. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, good morning, good evening, good night. <laughs> um, let me open my slides. So you heard the official title. Um, here's my alternative title. Uh, Mama always said you could tell a lot about an E. coli isolate by its shoes, where it's been and where it's going. And so the idea here is that we, by looking at um, accessory elements, particularly mobile genetic elements, we can start to predict what host an E. coli came from, regardless of where we isolated it. And so this is the official title. So, you know, I think it's important to, to just sort of start off with this fact that E. coli is a very versatile organism. Um, you know, just looking at the broad host range, you know, we're Y'all are FAO, and so I think think about some of the major food animal species, at least in the United States, these are the dominant food animal species. Um, e. coli colonizes all of them. Uh, it also colonizes our, our uh, interesting clip art person here. So it also colonizes us, right? So most, most humans have e some level of E. coli in their gut, and that E. coli is dynamic. And so... You know, from a from a molecular perspective, there are you know thousands of E. coli strains out there. You know, if you just look at the MLST database, you'll see you know literally thousands of different MLST sequence types. Um, but from a clinical perspective, E. coli can really be binned, excuse me, into three different categories. You know, kind of the good or commensal, you know, benign E. coli that we all are probably carrying now. There's the diarogenic E. coli, those kind that cause diarrhea, you know, uh, like 0157H7 associated with feedlot cattle. And then there's the, what I say super bad, but you know, it's the, it's the biggest killer are the ones that cause urinary tract infections. And those have lots of different monikers um, from UPEC, urinary tract, you know, infecting E. coli to uh, neonatal meningitis E. coli, but they all fall under this umbrella of extra intestinal pathogenic E. coli. So extra intestine, so it causes disease outside of the intestine. It's actually, they're typically benign in the intestine, so they behave like a commensal otherwise. But when they get introduced into the urinary tract, they can cause infections. Uh, they get introduced into the blood, they can cause infections. And, you know, this is a big big pathogen around the world, one of the biggest killers around the world. And, and, um, and the dominant organism when it comes to AMR deaths around the world. And so they have special virulence factors. They can, um, they can adhere to 
you know, the, the cells of the urethra and even under sheer force, actually they lock down even tighter under sheer force. They can cause bladder infections, kidney infections, and uh, sepsis due to, or sorry, deaths due to sepsis. So in the United States, we estimate 36,000 to 40,000 uh, deaths due to sepsis. So um, I just want to make sure that, oh, sorry. I'm, <laughs> I saw the, I saw the chat came up and I just want to make sure that wasn't for me. Okay, I'm going to ignore it otherwise. So, um, in you know, we see that they're extensively resistant E. coli strains becoming common around the world. The problem with this, you know, this extensive resistance is that if you can't stop a, an infection at the bladder, then it can it can ascend the ureters and get into the kidneys. And once it's in the kidneys, it has access to the blood, right? And so you know, when you present with a bladder infection, there's an opportunity. When you present with a kidney infection, there's an opportunity. Uh, but once it's in the blood, you have, you know, if somebody's septic, you know, minutes count. And the more resistant an E. coli strain is, the, the more dangerous the situation is. So I want to lock this relationship together just for those of you who don't realize, I mean, I learned late in my career uh, that UTIs, most UTIs are caused by E. coli. So, uh, you know, 80% plus of urinary tract infections are caused by E. coli. Um, they can live in our guts without symptoms, as I mentioned before. And we get these, we get these urinary tract infections, uh, abbreviated as UTIs here, um, when these strains make this short trip from the anus to the urethra. Now, women are at a much greater risk for UTIs uh, because of the anatomy makes that trip easier. But we've been asking this question, not how do people get UTIs? I think that that's pretty well established, but how do we get the UTI causing E. coli into our guts? Because again, it's, it's, a, it's not all strains that can do this. And so we know that people can pass them, you know, pass strains from person to person. And this is almost certainly the dominant pathway, right? Is that we, you know, the, the world's covered in a thin layer of poo, and we're sharing E. coli strains all the time. And the people that we live with are the people that were most at risk for picking those up. Um, and then, you know, sexually, sexual intimacy, et cetera, can increase risk. But we've also been asking this question, you know, can people pick these up from food animals? And this does not, this question does not originate with me. I mean, this, this question started with, uh, with studies from the 1960s in the UK where they had outbreaks of urinary tract infections in hospitals that were traced back to, to they suspected poultry products in the kitchen. And then people like Jim Johnson, Amy Mangus, Lee Riley, uh, and others around the world have been studying this, the potential transmission. And really what we're looking at is, uh, you know, not so much direct transmission from the animals, but probably via meat. Because when we look in grocery stores and we look at meat, it's they're almost always contaminated, or sorry, I should say very frequently contaminated with E. coli. So uh, several years ago now, we started a study um, in Flagstaff, Arizona, this small geographically isolated city near the Grand Canyon. Um, there was no food animal production there. And we decided we would go to every grocery store in the city twice per month buy every brand of chicken, turkey, and pork. We didn't buy beef because beef was not suspected as a source at the time. And um, we bought every brand, brought it back, cultured it for E. coli. And then we partnered with the only hospital in the town and got every E. coli from uh, every urinary tract infection and blood infection there. And so by the end of the year, we cultured nearly 2,000 E. coli from meat and nearly 1,200 from uh, UTIs and blood. Now we also have, we have a, uh, another study that we're just completing in California with nearly 7,000 isolates. So uh, maybe next time I can present on that. So the big question here is, you know, what's the population overlap between the E. coli in the retail meat supply and the E. coli causing infections in people? And this was sort of my first uh, uh, experience, not my first experience with naivety, but the first for this study, my big sort of naive thought was that I could just draw evolutionary trees like we'd done when we were investigating the Haitian cholera outbreak or when we were trying to understand the evolutionary history of SC398 or, you know, other 
you know, other outbreak situations, I thought we could just use those models. And so our plan was to use a three-step approach, which was to sequence the genomes, uh, perform MLST. So we basically just extract an MLST sequence type from the whole genome sequences. And then, um, and then for every sequence type where there was both meat and human isolates, we would do a whole genome, single nucleotide polymorphism based phylogeny. So in other words, a core genome phylogeny on each sequence type. So we could really understand those fine level uh, relationships. So here's what the sequence types look like. So we found 456 different sequence types among the samples, um, some more prevalent than others. And so the size of the bubble here, each number here represents the sequence type and the size of the bubble represents how many isolates uh, had that sequence type. And if we isolated a sequence, an isolate from meat, it's in red. And if it was from a human urine sample or blood, it's in this nice urine yellow here. Um, this person clearly had some vitamins or is dehydrated. But uh, so you have you have um, ST131, no big surprise, is the most prevalent among humans. ST117 should not be uh, a huge surprise either. This is a prevalent one, at least in uh, the United States today, in poultry production. And, and so we decided, all right, this is, this is very interesting because none of them are very few are pure gold or pure red. There's always these, this overlap. And so we started drawing trees and we started with ST131 because it was so important. And most studies had suggested there was no food involvement. And, and our own evolutionary studies suggested there was no food involvement, but but I was intrigued by this, you know, this big group of meat associated isolates. So we performed a, a core genome phylogeny. This is an unrooted tree. The again, the same colors uh, hold up. So human isolates are in um, gold and meat isolates are in red. And you see that the tree has these different clusters. So this cluster up here, H30, is the the pandemic strain of ST131 that's killing a lot of people today. It's nearly, you know, it's extensively resistant, fluoroquinolone, cephalosporin, et cetera. But you see all the meats are falling here in H22, uh, another FEM H, so this has to do with Fembrae. But you also see human isolates clustering and some clustering very closely. So what we did was we just used the genomes from the H22s and we did a higher resolution tree and this one, this time, this is a rooted tree. And what we see is that we see some clusters, some clades where we have very closely related human and meat isolates, human and meat, meat isolates. So we thought we had it here and, and, and we said, all right, this is clear evidence that there's transmission from poultry uh, to people. But when we submitted the paper, the reviewers pointed out that, you know, hey, you didn't show us the direction and you don't really have of transmission and you don't really have clonal relationships here. These, there's a lot of variability here. And in fact, there's very few clonal relationships in this, in this tree. And this really underscored the diversity of E. coli and one of our big struggles with this. And so we went back to the drawing board here and, um, and you know, we started thinking about this diversity and the fact that we're using these tools that are really for outbreak investigations. And so, you know, think about if you're a population biologist, if you're thinking about trying to define the E. coli that are colonizing, you know, 100,000 chickens in a poultry house, how many samples would you want? I, I'd want a lot of samples, right? But then if you scale it to, and I'm sorry for the U.S. focus, but that's where I do my research. And, and so, um, We'll just use the U.S. as an example here. Um, most of our poultry production is in what we call the broiler belt, these southeastern United States, some in California, some up the West Coast, but mostly here. And each dot here represents a, a million broiler chickens. And so we produce 9 billion broiler chickens across the United States, mostly in here. And, you know, so now think about that one farm and you've got them scattered across here. And how many samples would you want now? I, I think it's practically important, impossible to sample enough to really define the E. coli populations. And so, and we're using these tools that are really best suited for outbreak investigations. 
you know, we're making trees and we're counting SNPs. That works when you have a young clone disseminating from a single point source, which is usually the case for an outbreak, right? Um, so that's exactly what this slide says. So here's a visual for that. So you have a farm that has a, a new strain of salmonella, for instance, multidrug resistant salmonella emanating from a single farm. Well, that's getting, you know, that's contaminating poultry products and then getting packaged up and disseminated across the country. But that will, you know, you can trace that back with, you know, product codes and, and looking at epidemic curves. You can potentially trace this back. Now, the industry's made it very hard to do that in the United States, but it, it is possible to at least trace it to a slaughterhouse. But the E. coli populations that are causing urinary tract infections, this XPEC, are old, diverse, and diversified. That is, that you know, even around a single clone, like an ST, sorry, a single lineage, there's a lot of diversity, a lot of SNPs there. And so what you have instead of this, you know, single point source is that you have this constant bleeding over from the food supply into the human communities. And, you know, clearly I'm not drawing all the arrows here. This would be a very, very red map. What would make a lot of Democrats nervous in the United States. Um, so, but what I realized is that we really don't need to pinpoint a specific farm. What we're trying to ask, the question is not to, at least at this stage, we're not trying to say, hey, which farm are these coming from? Because we know it's, we, we suspect that it's bleeding across the entire industry. We just want to know, hey, which ones are coming from chickens or pigs or cattle and which ones are coming from people? And, and so that's a different, very different question and takes a different molecular approach. Um, and so, you know, I'm a pretty simple guy and, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if E. coli just wore uniforms so we could tell where they've been, right? So when you see a person that works in a hospital in their in their hospital scrubs or their white coat, hopefully they're not wearing that in the grocery store. But when you see them wearing those in the grocery store, you know where they work. And, and I would love something like that for E. coli. And so this is an, my, my second Forrest Gump reference here. Um, you know, so one of the scenes in the movie, I don't know if you're familiar with this movie, but um, it's it was a kind of a culturally iconic film in the United States. He's sitting on the park bench and he sees this woman and he points at her shoes and he says, you know, those look like comfortable shoes. And then he says, mama, my mom says that you can always, you can tell a lot about a person by their shoes, where they've been, where they're going. And I can tell just by looking at this person that she's a nurse. She works in a hospital. She's got the white shirt, shoes. She's got the white gown. I mean, this is a nurse. And, and this is what we need for E. coli. And so I, I talked to my colleague, Tim Johnson, Timothy Johnson at University of Minnesota, and he's been studying these avia, avian adaptive coal V plasmids for years. And he said, hey, have you screened your collection for these? And so we screened them. And sure enough, you know, 64, 63% of the poultry isolates had these coal V plasmids, and only 5% of humans. And so from my perspective, you know, these really look like the shoes that E. coli wears when they're hanging out with chickens, right? And so this was our first hint at using mobile host-associated mobile genetic elements as potential source trackers. And the cool thing about these is that they're unstable when you take them out of the, the avian host, right? So here is uh, this LB broth. This is E. coli with coal V plasmids grown in LB broth. Those plasmids are stable. That's easy living for E. coli and, and LB broth. And here's chicken litter. So they're grown in chicken litter. That's really stable. Here's the chicken cecum. The plasmids are super stable. And this is a, a, a graph from Tim Johnson at University of Minnesota. This is what happens when he introduced the E. coli to the mouse gut. They drop that plasmid very quickly. And so um, this is, I think, pretty cool because over time, as they switch hosts, they're going to shed these plasmids and they'll probably take on new ones. And so we could use these to recognize recent spillover. And so the idea here is that we have a person um, currently smiling, but she gets a urinary tract infection. So we can collect a, a urine sample and then culture E. coli, and if we see these Colby plasmids, that's a pretty good hint that maybe that E. coli came from chickens. And so we went back to our, 
our SC131 study and we decorated the tree with these plasmids, the Cole V plasmids. And sure enough, what we found was that um, almost all of the poultry isolates carried these plasmids as did the human isolates that were most closely related. And so for us, this was pretty strong evidence that these people were picking up E. coli from poultry. Now they didn't pick it up from this, this chicken, but they picked it up from chicken, the chicken population. And the, the reviewers were convinced. So we hypothesized that, that E. coli populations adapt to these different vertebrate hosts by shedding and acquiring different host associated mobile genetic elements. And Col-V is clearly not the only host associated mobile genetic element in E. coli. E. coli has a massive accessory genome. And so there's a lot of, a lot of data to mine there. And so we started mining the data. And so we think that there's a lot of different shoes that they're wearing. And so by doing a large scale comparative genomics, we've identified 17 host associated mobile genetic elements in E. coli. And, and I'll just say that I don't think that we exhausted the full um, accessory uh, genome here. And so we're gonna, we're continuing to mine, but we found 11 associated with one or more food animal species. Um, and then we found six associated with humans. Now, all of our isolates were invasive isolates, or sorry, they were uh, associated with symptomatic disease. And so we may be picking up here, you know, plasmids associated with virulence, but uh, they were very strongly correlated. And so here's, here's our um, heat map. Here are the, the strength of the association between these elements, H1 through 6, the human associated elements, with the human isolates versus meat isolates. And here are the meat associated mobile genetic elements uh, association with humans versus meat. And you see uh, obviously this inverse pattern. Um, and what I'll, what I'll tell you right here is that uh, there was a lot of collinearity among the different meat isolates. So chicken, turkey, and pork. And so we only use this in a dichotomous fashion. So meat versus humans. We're currently working on, uh, by increasing our, our pool of genomes by, I, as I mentioned, I think another 7,000 genomes, we're hoping that we're going to be able to break this down and, and be very specific about the different hosts in the future. So here's the next time I was, I was very naive with this study. Um, I thought we could just combine all of these assays together and that we would go to, you know, 100% um, specificity sorry, sensitivity. Um, but what I quickly realized is that as we combine these, we were really, we increased to over 90% sensitivity for detecting humans. These are the human assays, but our specificity started decreasing, right? So the more we used, uh, the less specific they were. And it really got bad when we were looking at the meat isolates. So our specificity really plummeted down to, you know, between 30 and 40%. And and so we needed a different model than to just combine these in a straight fashion. And so that's when I, I talked to my mathematician friends here, Dan Park, Jenka Wu, and, um, and through a medium, we spoke to Thomas Bayes, so the father of Bayesian statistics. And, um, and this was really the brainchild of Dan and, and Jenka using this Bayesian latent class model. And so, I, I want to explain this approach using sort of a cartoon version here. So um, with the Bayesian approach, you know, you have a person with a UTI, we get the culture and we get an E. coli. Now we want to know, did this come from a human or did it come from food animals or meat? And so initially we just have a probability, you know, that E. coli so will come from a human or food animal. Uh, but we do MLST and we get a specific sequence type that might shift the prospect probability so that now we have a different posterior probability that 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 e coli came from a particular host and then we can start looking at our host elements and as we run through there um, that posterior probability will change and your yeah your you can start to um, estimate a probability that uh, that an e coli came from a particular host and so this is the way this this uh, this is kind of a dumb explanation for how the model works, but this is the way I think of uh, a Bayesian 
latent class model working. The great part about this is that by training the model, then we could go back and run our entire data set and we could get a probability that an isolate came from a person or from meat. And this is really super straightforward. And, and, and so what we did was we said, all right, we had to go with 80% or better, and then we would call it from a particular source. And um, so that's what we did. And here are our urine isolates and the probability of a meat origin, right? So um, here we have our human isolates. Most of them have, you know, nearly 80% have a 0% probability of coming from meat, but we have 8.4% of them that have an 80% or prob better probability of coming from meat based on the model. Now, this could be a sloppy model. So we looked at the meat isolates and we asked the same thing. And what you see is that um, almost none, 0.5% of the meat isolates had an 80% better pro probability of coming from humans. So this suggested, A, we handled our samples well, that was a relief. And the model is pretty tight, right? That the model appears to be uh, doing what it's supposed to. And we also obviously ran some formal testing. So we, we deemed these foodborne zoonotic E. coli, and we estimate, again, about 8% of human UTIs in the United States, where we have very high quality water sanitation, hygiene, and uh, food animals are produced far away from humans, we have about 8% overlap. Now that might sound like a small number, but that exceeds any of the other major uropathogenic species like Enterococcus or, or um, Klebsiella. And when you translate that to a national level, we're talking about 480,000 to 640,000 urinary tract infections per year that may be foodborne zoonotic E. coli. Um, it turns out that FSEC isolates are similar to non-FSEC isolates, so, you know, extra intestinal pathogenic E. coli that appears to come from people, they have similar, they're similar in terms of virulence. So here's the virulence data. The only place where they were a little bit different, sorry, uh, they're the same when it comes to, not statistically different when it comes to cystitis. The place where they were different was they were less likely to cause pyelonephritis, but they were, um, they were not different in terms of ability to cause sepsis. A few strains appear to have an enhanced zoonotic potential. So here we have, we've plotted the prevalence of a specific sequence type in among the meat isolates. So this sort of is a, a gauge of stochastic potential for an E. coli strain to sort of bleed over into the food supply. So the higher up it is, the more likely a human is going to come in contact with it by handling meat. And then the x-axis here represents the percent of clinical cases that um, of a particular sequence type. So the further right on this axis, the more potentially virulent they are. Now this is this is all cases including asymptomatic bacteria. So that's just bacteria in the bladder. Here is symptomatic cases. So this is uh, confirmed cystitis and pyelonephritis and sepsis. And what you see is that a couple of sequence types really jump out, ST131, ST58, um, 10, and 69 are, you know, further right on this chart. Um, ST, you know, 117's, you know, still right about uh, 5%. And, and so it may be a little less benign, but has a lot of stochastic potential. And then here are our sepsis isolates, and really ST58 jumped out. Uh, but this is a very small number of sepsis isolates. And so this is one case versus two. I'm not putting a lot of uh, weight on this yet. We're doing some additional sepsis studies now. So when I think about this and I, and I talk about these high risk strains and I talk about my, to my colleagues like Tim Johnson at University of Minnesota, I find that some of these strains also cause disease in livestock, you know, particularly poultry actually. And, and so by you know, developing vaccines against these strains and applying them to the food animals, I think we could really have a win-win for public health and food animal production, where we could decrease disease in the animals and then also decrease the bleeding over of these strains to people. And I'm really, I love win-wins. I often find myself, you know, angering 
the food animal industry in the United States by, you know, whining about antibiotic use and, and uh, disease. But I think that um, this is one place where we could really team up. And when it comes to antibiotic resistance, uh, you know, these strains were not, you know, they, they were fairly reflective of what we saw in the, among the meat isolates, uh, but they were distinct from both meat and humans. And so these are our FSEX, so these are human clinical isolates that appear to be of zoonotic origin. You know, they were resistant to some important drugs, you know, um, and, uh, but significantly less resistant than the human clinical isolates. And I really, you know, mark this up to the FDA's limiting of some of the most important antibiotics in food animal production in the United States over the past two decades. So we're st we still stand out among high-income countries in terms of quantity of antibiotics that we use, but we are mostly using tetracycline. Um, and I say we, I'm not using any in animals, but the, the industry uses uh, a lot still, but mostly tetracycline. And so I think that's prevented us from having the worst um, resistance patterns here. Uh, so these FSEC appear to be unique from both food as animal isolates and non-FSEC isolates in, in terms of resistance. But I think it's really important to point out, especially with this international group, that these strains could vary widely with geographic lo location because of differences in antimicrobial use. You know, it's a big planet, and uh, particularly the BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, we've seen this rapid, we're seeing this rapid development and this rapid sort of shift to meat-centric diets. And so we're seeing a lot of industrial, you know, industrialization of poultry production, um, pork production in some countries. And, um, and so this could be a problem. And we've seen, uh, hopefully you've seen this Tom Van Bokel um, study about antimicrobial a previous study about antimicrobial use and this one about resistance rates. And what we see is the steady increase. And so, you know, I, I think we have to keep this in mind. And, and so likewise, I think the prevalence, just specifically the prevalence of FSEC infections could vary widely because of differences in environmental controls like water sanitation and hygiene, but also the proximity of animal production to human, human communities and the level of you know, subsistence farming. And so we've, we have a paper that's uh, under press right now about antimicrobial use and food animal production in Cambodia. You know, in Cambodia, you, know, you have, you have over-the-counter use of antimicrobials in humans. You have antimicrobial over-the-counter use of antimicrobials in industrialized animal production. You even have antimicrobial use in subsistence farming. Um, you have untreated human waste going into surface waters, you have animal waste going into surface waters, you have food being produced in those surface waters, you have open defecation, you have, uh, of, you know, fish farms, and then you have some um, rudimentary slaughtering procedures. And, and so I think the ability for sort of bi-directional exchange is really underscored in an environment like this. And so I, I just want to wrap up with my last couple of slides so that we can have a lot of time to talk. And, and so, you know, our current efforts right now are to expand our host associated element panel. And so we have, again, another um, eight, seven or 8,000 E. coli genomes that we're analyzing. Actually, more than that, because we've scraped the databases. Um, we are looking to, uh, again, get very specific with the host predictions. I don't know that we'll ever be able to split, you know, chicken from turkey. And globally, I don't know that that matters because turkey's kind of, you know, very regionally produced. Um, it's popular here, especially at Thanksgiving. Um, we want to improve host, uh, that's what I just said, <laughs> improve host predictions. We would love to develop an online tool uh, with, you know, Pathogen Watch and, and other groups so that people can upload a genome from anywhere in the world and then get a prediction. We're also, and, and this, is, uh, this is an important one, and I'm really putting a call out to you and to your colleagues. We would love to expand our isolate collections from, from humans and from uh, particularly from the dominant food animal species in low and middle income countries um, so that we can look at geographic variation and, and host elements and develop a, a geographically informed 
Bayesian latent class model that would allow people, again, to upload a, a genome or you know, send an isolate for sequencing, upload that genome, say what, uh, what geographic region they're from, and then get a prediction of, of source. And so if you have isolate, contemporary isolate collections, uh, or you'd like to partner, please email me at lprice at, at gw.edu. This is not a product. <laughs> I'm just, this is a collaboration, George. Um, anyway, so that's the last of my uh, official slides. Um, here's this, the, the requested slide here. And then I just want to acknowledge all my wonderful colleagues before I open it up to questions. So my colleagues at uh, George Washington University, uh, Maliha Aziz, our bioinformaticist, Dan Park, who's an amazing statistician, epidemiologist, uh, Northern Arizona University, um, uh, particularly Paul Keim, University of Minnesota, Jim Johnson, Tim Johnson. Jim came up with the term XPEC. Uh, Staten Serum Institute in Denmark, Mark Steger, University of Michigan. So Jenka Wu and Mingbing Li, uh, his doctoral student, were really pivotal in developing these uh, Bayesian latent class models. And then, of course, my funders and uh, my old colleagues at TGen. And with that, I'll stop my sharing and open it up to discussion. Thank you very much, Lance. And I knew it would be good. I didn't expect it to be this good, huh? So you, oh. it's it's really the the and we we uh, aim to have these webinars on data rich presentations, and uh, yours could not be more data rich and. Uh, yeah, regarding source attribution, and and I think some of these data will be a lot of useful for risk managers later in the, in the, down the road. And uh, you, what you mentioned, the connections with the different use volumes and the different antimicrobial uh, use policies is something that is super interesting to further analyze. And you did it very well. The, the goal of this um, webinars is to trigger collaborations to find. We are we are all aware of the dimension of AMR. And we want this forum, uh, this platform to be used to find solutions, not just uh, reinforce the problem. So yeah, yeah, like you said, it's, it will be much appreciated if this will trigger sharing isolates with you from low and middle income countries. And I see that you have a lot of participants from several different countries and regions. So um, yeah, I think you did it. Thank you for um, inviting them to collaborate thank with you. you. Thank you. I yeah, we and we and we have some funds that we could, you know, we could pay for sequencing and shipping and and so I would really love to work with people. Brilliant. We got a question. It's an interesting one because you, you mentioned a lot of about chicken and poultry. So you got a question regarding do vegetarians and vegans get less urinary tract infections and uh, how how would this relate to your work? Yeah, so, uh, you know, Amy Mangus is, I, I think, just a really brilliant epidemiologist. She she left the field about 10 years ago, but um, prior to leaving, she'd done some studies looking at um, poultry consumption, poultry handling, and risk for UTIs, and uh, there was, there was a, a dose-response relationship. So the more exposure you had to poultry, the less, the more likely you were to get a urinary tract infection, and and we know that, you know, the the uh, XPEC are you know sort of predominant and pre predominate in poultry products, and so um, I think that that's pretty good evidence. I haven't I haven't seen great studies on uh, vegetarianism yet. I think one of my concerns there is that um, I don't. I, I think it clearly could reduce your risk. If you're not handling these products in your kitchen, you know, there's less risk for cross-contamination now, I would assume. Um, but, you know, the problem is that the, the fecal waste from those animals is used as fertilizer. And so I, I think that you do have this environmental dissemination. And then, you know, if you're a vegetarian that also dines in kitchens where they handle meat, then there can be cross-contamination um, there as well. But yeah, I, I would suspect that it would reduce your risk. Great. Thank you, Lance. Next question. Uh, how do you think the, besides complimenting you, how no. do you think the host <laughs> level resolution of mobile genetic elements will work out, especially once low and middle income data is available, taking into account the leakiness between hosts and environment and the bidirectional, multidirectional transmission? 
Hey, I love that somebody used this the term leaky. Uh, that's great. <laughs> Leakiness. Because, yeah, we've tried to introduce this term, so that's that's brilliant. So uh, with Maya Nadam Polly, who's now at um, Emory. So I think that that's going to be a challenge for us, right? Is that as we go into low and middle income countries, I think the system becomes noisier. And and what I, I'll just this is <laughs> between you know, us in this room, we, you know, we've been, we've been analyzing uh, publicly available data, uh, data. And what we see is that it appears that people living in low and middle income countries might have twice the risk of sort of the high end people living in high income countries for invasive infection by these foodborne zoonotic strains. Um, and so I do think that leakiness is going to play a role. Now, the question is, you know, how do we identify, you know, in a robust way, mobile genetic, host associated mobile genetic elements in these leaky systems, right? Because the more they bleed together, and I think this is the point of the question, the more they bleed together, the less clear the signal is going to be. And so I think we've got to hold our judgment, judgment until we get in there and start to assess this. But we may have to you know, develop our models as best we can in the higher income countries, in the cleaner setting, you know, just, sorry, less leaky setting, and then, um, and then apply them in these settings so that we have that clear signal. We know what we're talking about in terms of uh, host associate elements. And then, but it could be that, you know, that there are industrialized animal production systems that are well enough isolated in some of these places where we can start to get that. Um, but again, it's, it's an open question that we're very eager to explore. There you are. So maybe you've just started the new collaboration with Dan Shark. <laughs> could leave it asking the question. The next one, um, about uh, what about the role of the environment? Uh, the colleague has done some limited work at surface waters, and many of the nasty E. coli they found were expects and UTI associated sequence types. Could these faulty strains be environmental strains that are being shared between environment, environment, humans, and animals? So the one health perspective of this this issue. Yeah, certainly, and and um, you know I think that there have been some studies uh, out of Japan um, looking at wild animals that are picking up some of the really important expect strains. Um, and, and so I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that there's can be uh, this, this movement of the strains from human populations into the environment through contaminated surface waters. There can be from the food animal populations themselves you know, think about migratory birds, you know, I think about the what's called the Delmarva Peninsula here across the Chesapeake Bay from where I live. And, you know, there's half a billion chickens that are raised out there. And then you have migratory birds that come in and they land and they feed around these, these chicken houses, right. And so I think the ability for these wild animals to pick up these strains and then carry them around is also big. And then the wild animals themselves might have their own avian pathogenic strains that can be shared with people. And so it's, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a world full of poo, right? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but I think what's happening when you compare those sort of natural populations to what's happening in industrialized food animal production, though, it's a very different uh, risk formula because of the, the rampant use of antimicrobials, right? And so I think that that really elevates the risk because you know, we talk about antibiotics being the sort of the foundation of modern medicine, but but in some low and middle income countries, they're not the foundation of modern medicine. They are modern medicine, and if that antibiotic doesn't that that antibiotic that somebody got at a clinic for you know for a dollar or whatever, if that doesn't work, they could die because they can't afford anything else, right? And so. I think that we really have to value these. And, and unfortunately, this model, and I and I really want to own this for the, the Americans, right? We developed this industrialized model using antibiotics, and we've exported it to the world as this sort of super efficient way uh, to raise animals. Meanwhile, over the past 20 years, the FDA has started to ratchet back the antibiotics that can be used in a very sort of slow and frustrating way for me. But 
they have ratcheted back in a nuanced way. But that nuance, I think, has been lost for a lot of a lot of countries around the world. And so you're seeing sort of no holds barred use of antibiotics and, and animals. And I think that that's a huge threat. And then some of these, sorry, this is a long answer, but some of these countries have, you know, one of the ways that they're generating income is by producing, mass producing animals and then, and then exporting products, right? And so uh, they can be exporting very contaminated, potentially dangerous products. Product. Okay, thank you, Lance. The next one, um, again, more compliments, well-deserved compliments to your presentation. Uh, the colleagues have been recently looking at the potential transmission of E. coli from healthcare settings and community settings. There was high resistance for both, I believe, antibiotics resistance. However, they did not see much whole strain relationship, but rather mobile genetic elements. Could this mean independent chlorine clonal transmission, or how would these mobile genetic elements be moving around outside the whole strains? Yeah, so I I want to make sure that we're clear when we're talking about mobile genetic elements. So the there's I've got, you know, these host associated mobile genetic elements that are not necessarily associated with antimicrobial resistance that I'm using to sort of identify host. But then we've got these mobile resistance elements, the R, R plasmids, for instance, you know, the resistance elements. That are moving as well, and so I've been, you know, in in my career, I've been mostly interested in the clonal transmission or the, you know, the transmission of strains from food animals to people, and really trying to trying to quantify that. The other really important aspect is the movement of resistance elements, right? So you have the evolution of these new combinations of of resistance elements in animals or in people that can then be transferred from, you know from one group of hosts to another, depending on, you know, wash conditions and other conditions. And, and I think, you know, the most striking example, uh, kind of contrasting example that I've seen of this, and, and this is in the Maya Not and Polly's paper that we've, you know, it's on bioarchives right now, but, uh, you know, it's this leakiness paper that we've, we wrote up, is that, you see, if you compare the United Kingdom and the the exchange of of ESBL genes between food animals and people, there's very little overlap, right? So, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, very high quality water sanitation, hygiene, separation of of animals and people. Then you compare that to what we're seeing in Cambodia, and you know there's tons of overlap with the ESBL genes. And the most striking thing that I saw there was that we saw this, we looked at the evolutionary tree of E. coli there. Of, so we just looked at all the E. coli strains, we drew a tree, and then we looked at this one transposon that had, had uh, the QNR gene, so fluoroquinolone resistance and ESBL resistance on this transposon, and it was scattered across the tree. This really suggests that these things are, are moving uh, prolifically in that setting, and, and we just don't, we've, We've never seen that here. Right. I hope that answered your question. I think so. Um, one question about the importance of uh, the proper identification of the species. And the colleague is asking, what about the misidentification of some strains like Ischerichia alberti? Is this possible? Can this be happening? Uh, it, it certainly can be happening, but not in our, in our study because we did whole genome sequencing and we identified the species by the whole genome sequence. And so I think in our case, you know, it's, it's, it's clean. And, and I think, yeah, it really depends on your, how you're doing your species ID, but I, I you know, I think that that's important. Um, I don't know. I don't know the virulence potential of that, that particular species. I'm not familiar with it anyway. All right. Um, the next one, uh, colleagues that have been looked at convention E. coli from animals with a majority with MC, BLA EC15. What do you think is so special about this BLA EC15 and not another bactalectomasis? Uh, so that's the CTXM15, right? Um, yes. Yeah. So I, I think the, the big thing about CTXM15 is that it found it it found true romance in the in the um 
ST131 lineage, right? So it um, that was this perfect marriage for damage to humans, right? So ST131 is this amazing colonizer. It's really sticky. Um, oh, sorry. I had Bla it wrong. EC15. Oh, you know, I I actually can't speak to Blah EC15. I'm sorry. I was not familiar with that. No, sorry. All right. Good. The next one is the the it's a good proposal on the the possibility of making a microbial committee that you can share information from time to time. Those that are interested in following up on your research, how will they be able to? Is there already a formal mechanism to change information about this or? Could you repeat the question? So the availability to make a microbial committee so that you can be sharing information from time to time. Well, I, you know, I've, I'm, I'm happy to, to share anytime you want to invite me back. Um, I, I'm, um, and I think I would really love to develop an um, international network of of people particularly working on um, bloodstream infections, but also that we could we could look at um, uh, food animal species in the low and middle income countries. So I I don't know the best way to to establish that, but maybe George, maybe this is something that that we, yeah, can, we can follow up. Continue to talk about because yeah. Um, yeah, I mean I I can tell you that we actively try to translate our work so whenever we publish something new we try to put it out in pretty plain english so that people can uh digest it but um and we have a whole series of papers coming out i'm still i'm still embarrassed that i don't know much about blah ec15 but i'm going to learn about well it there you are you can follow up on on the and the, the afterwards the, the webinar and the last question that we'll take just for the sake of time a colleague is asking, why do you think people in Cambodia are not showing more antimicrobial resistance healiness, given the conditions presented in your slide, meaning increased exposure? Wait, could you start from the top? I... Why do you think people in Cambodia are not showing more AMR healiness, given the conditions presented in your slide, meaning increased exposure? Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know the incidence rates in in Cambodia. What I know are the, um, you know, all I know are the E. coli samples that we collected there. That sorry, that Maya collected there. I can't really take any credit for the collection, just analysis, but um, just the level of resistance that we're seeing there. Uh, yeah, I don't know who is tracking incidence rates you know, globally is anybody. I mean, it's really glass is supposed to start doing this, right? So yeah, from the human show, side. I don't know that we really have a good uh, sort of across the world comparison yet. Um, All right. Thank you, Lance. I think we will stop it here for the questions. And uh, but thank you very much for your presentation. What a privilege to all of us to be able to click on a link and listen to these presentations. And I think uh, uh, throughout the presentation and now in the discussion, several follow-up possibilities came up and uh, a very concrete one, like you said, the possibility of colleagues to sh send you some isolates. And then from there, maybe you can reach the microbial committee that was also suggested in the, the chat. So I'll yeah. stop it here. Let's just share the, the upcoming, uh, you can share, yes. Um, so the next one will be on June 18. Uh, and this time we'll be focusing on Asia and the resistance to last resort across One Health oops, uh, in Thailand and neighboring countries by a professor, uh, Hungtip, from the university from Thailand. And uh, we'll send you out the feedback questionnaire. And if you have any further suggestions or ideas for this work, you can email us uh, via antimicrobial resistance at fao.org. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye bye.